Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back. And nowadays everybody seems to be talking about crypto money, how rich you can get and how good it is. But when you ask the people, what is this all about? How does it work? Do you know what this is? Then you get maybe one out of 100 persons who knows what it is. Now I started digging into this and wanted to find out what the technology is behind it, what's the security. In fact, what is it? So I'm going to try in this video to explain you what crypto money is or virtual money is, but I will also give you my opinion and my view for the future on it, purely based on my experience. Now I am an old-fashioned computer architect from a long time ago. That's what I studied, so I have a little bit of knowledge of computers and science and also mathematics and a little bit of uh, programming. So I think I understood it, but maybe not. And if I misunderstood it, I'm sure you will correct me. So I'm going to explain you what crypto money is, how it works. And then at the end, I will give you my opinion forever what it's worth. And I'll hope with five years from now, we can look back and see if my prediction was right or wrong. So crypto money uh, came onto the market in the year 2008. So not that long ago and the very early cryptocurrency or virtual money was the Bitcoin. And maybe it's a coincidence, but the year 2008 is also marked as the year of the big bank crises. Now the whole intent of a cryptocurrency that was set out in the year 2008 was to be able to make a transfer between two persons without a middleman. And as you all know, today, if you're making a bank transfer, you're doing a payment with your bank card or with your credit card, it is the credit card company or it's the bank that is actually arranging the transfer. They are looking at your account to see if you have sufficient money in your account before they can make a payment to a third party. And obviously, the bank makes money on these transfers. The bank is a proving area. The bank is an institution. The bank is often controlled by other banks or an overarching organization or even by the government for that matter. So banks are playing a very important role in our current environment with normal legal tender money, our hard euros and dollars. Now I know the euros and the dollars, they don't keep their value over time. They slowly decrease in value. What you can buy today for a dollar or a euro, you can no longer buy next year. It's going to maybe be one dollar and five cents. It's going to increase a bit uh, the price of a product. In fact, the product doesn't increase. It's the currency that decreases uh, because of inflation. So over time, that goes down very slowly. Nevertheless, uh, so people invented something new. They said, well, what if we were able to take the middleman out and I can do a straight transfer between me and you. So we don't have to pay the fees. We are no longer dependent on the bank. So why don't we do this? Now, all that is good and well, uh, not having a middleman, but somebody has to keep track of the accounts. And typically what banks do, they keep a ledger. And the ledger is a journal which is chronological linked together. In other words, there are entries in the journal or in the ledger for every bank account and how much money is in the bank and how the money moved along between people, between bank accounts over time. Now a bank is keeping a central ledger. They have their big mainframes where they maintain all that. And all banks do this. And then of course you have exchanges between banks as well. But how does that work now with cryptocurrency if there is no middleman? So the problem with the centralized ledger was solved very easily. They decided that everybody on the internet could do the proofing of the transaction. You just need to subscribe to it, you get a piece of software, and then you do all kinds of calculations to prove that actually the transfer is valid, that you have the coins, the virtual coins to spend, and that the transfer is legal and valid. It also makes sure that there is no spoofing, that there is no uh, hacking possible on the network, and I'll come back to this later. So in order to do so, uh, they created what we call a distributed ledger. And a distributed ledger is very much the same as the ledger you find in a bank, a chronological order of transactions all linked together over time. But now this ledger is distributed throughout the whole internet. Now that is very, very interesting because now we rely fully on cyberspace, individuals out there, and it could be anybody, trying to validate the block and they all have the ledger or a part of the ledger. And that's why we call it the distributed ledger. A pretty good system to take the middleman out, but you can ask the question, well, is this not a new middleman? 
Now, anyhow, when these people are mining, and that's what we call mining, in, at least in the first generation of currency, because we've got three generations for the moment. The first generation was the Bitcoin I like. The second generation is Ether and other likes. And the third generation is Cardano. So they always improved over time because the Bitcoin has some limitations. Nevertheless, the person that is proving the transactions in a block, and once the block is proven, then the transactions are approved, and then the miner is getting an award for that because he is spending quite some money on electricity to do all the calculations because it's a very intense calculation. Early miners, actually, in the very early days, um, they could do it with the normal CPUs of their home computers, and they made some money with it. So if they prove a block, they get some extra coins. That's also the mechanism how you get coins back into the network, how you generate coins. But over time, it became more and more difficult to mine because demand and supply is there. So if there's a high demand for coins, then you don't want to throw too many new coins onto the market. So the mining becomes a little bit more difficult. So they couldn't use their old CPUs anymore. So they moved to VGA cards because VGA cards and computers are very fast to compute. But even that turned out to be no longer economical and then finally they resolved back to what we call ASICs and those are very specific chipsets that can do very very quick calculations and don't worry about these calculations we come back to that we'll come back to crypto we come back to hashing in a few minutes and I'm going to give you in fact an example on how that works nevertheless so the miners nowadays especially for the first generation types of uh, virtual money they really um, are huge companies. There's huge companies in Norway, there's huge companies in China and in the US that have rooms and rooms and buildings of ASICs running just to mine the Bitcoins. And this method happens everywhere. And the mining itself, the method for that, it's what we call proof of work. Now, the more recent uh, mining solutions uh, for Cardano, for instance, the third generation of cryptocurrency, it's a bit different. Uh, not everybody can mine anymore. Uh, you have to have, be a stakeholder. You have to have a stake. You have to have actually the Cardano coins. And the more coins you have, the more likely you will be elected to mine. Now, in Bitcoins, everybody can become a miner. So you can imagine that the whole world is trying to mine. And they worked out that the total energy consumption of all the miners for Bitcoins is about the same as the energy consumption of a country like Hungary over a full year. Now, that is pretty amazing. So you could say that Bitcoins are very, very uh, environmental unfriendly. Kind of strange because it's all virtual, it's all fictive. Uh, Cardano is a bit different. There we work with what we call proof of state. So only a selected group of people are elected every time to validate a new block and a new block contains all the transactions that we have done. All right, so uh, I come back to how these miners work. I will come back on how these blocks are generated and I will come back to the blockchain, which is your main part of a solution for crypto money to make it secure. So, so far we have seen that cryptocurrency allows you to do direct transactions between two persons and that there is no bank or no middleman is involved. The proofing is done by the miners. But now the question really is, what is the intrinsic value of crypto money? Because at the end, it doesn't exist. It's a bunch of ones and zeros. Ones and zeros that are developed by programmers. They placed it on the cyberspace, the internet, and they created kind of a hype. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, you can make money with a hype. And as long as people believe in it, then the value will go up. But it has no intrinsic value. A cup, a dollar, a euro, that has intrinsic value. You know what a cup is costing today. A cup is worth a dollar. It's worth a euro. But what is crypto money? It's worth nothing. It only has a value because people want it. It's a bit like art, but at least there you have something touchable. Here, there is nothing to be touched. It is a business, software programmers that are creating this kind of currency. And there's hundreds of currencies on the market. So you really need to think about this. You need to realize that crypto money has no intrinsic value. Now, if you're into speculation, for sure, 
This is good because it works on supply and demand. So the more people that want it, the more value it will get. <clears throat> and I call it virtual value. It's not real value. So if you buy it today, when the rate is low and you sell it tomorrow when the rate is high because more people wanted to buy it, then you make a profit. So in that concept, it's not bad. It, it works. But to be very honest, um, this is speculation. Now, the other problem we have with cryptocurrency is that the rate, the value, goes up and down real quick. It is not abnormal to see 2, 3, 4, 5 percent increase or decrease and even more within a day. So how do you buy things with this? So imagine I have crypto money and I want to buy a cup. And the cup is one dollar today. Well, if I want to buy this with my crypto money, my money goes up that quick up and down that today I probably it's, I, I, it costs me a euro, but tomorrow it will cost me a euro and 20 cents just because that very fast fluctuation of that value rate, uh, virtual value rate of that crypto money. So that makes it very difficult to do transactions with it, to buy goods with it. And some people are very smart and you know it's like always, uh, there's the big players and there's the small fish like us. We are typically believing the bigger players. We look at him. Think about Musk. He bought for millions of dollars, bitcoins. And then everybody looked at it and said, oh, he's doing it. I need to do it because it must be worth something. And people start doing this. And because all the rest of the world is now the small fish starts to buy uh, these coins, now the price goes up. So good for Musk, right? He bought it before that. So now he has more value. So you can see this is really all about gambling almost. Uh, this is speculation. So what I'm trying to say is that cryptocurrency today is not really suitable for transactions, to buy things. Uh, and I have to be careful when I say that. Transactions to buy things, to buy goods, it's no good. It, it, it just fluctuates too much. But it is good for speculation because you can come rich with it. So if you don't mind to spend your hard-earned euros and dollars, then you can take the chance to invest in crypto money and get a profit out of it as kind of a speculation. Now, besides all that, uh, and this is entirely up to you, of course, but this is my personal view and opinion. There is one other thing. Who are you going to go to if something goes wrong? There is nobody you can call. You can't go to the bank. I mean, if I lose my bank card, if I lose my PIN code, if I have a problem with my credit card, I'm calling the bank card company. I'm telling them, look, I lost my card and I have a card stop immediately. I'm sorry. With virtual money or crypto money, that ain't existing. That is not possible. You can't call anything. You play your own bank, at least in terms of safeguarding. It's your own responsibility. So that's another drawback. So don't hang up on me now because you might think I'm a skeptic because I'm not. I'm just trying to point out all the issues that cryptocurrency can have and all the limitations and the things you need to be aware of. It has a lot of other good things as well. It has all the benefits of living in the cyberspace. So it's easy access. It's mobile. You know, when you can do very quick transactions, you can sell and buy very quickly. So there's a lot of good things about it. And it's until now fairly secure. And I'll come back to that because since the Bitcoin was introduced in 2008, it hasn't been cracked. Nobody was able to steal some virtual coins. So the system is pretty solid knowing that we have a whole raft of crooks and criminals out there in cyberspace on the Internet. But anyhow, um, now let's see on how you can get crypto money. How do you acquire it? You heard me use the term crypto money and virtual money a couple of times and crypto refers to the fact that something is not readable, uh, something which is totally scrambled. So if I have a file or a text, I can encrypt it. So it's totally scrambled. You can't recognize anything anymore. And only if I know the key on how to descramble this, then uh, I can read the text again. You know, the Germans were very strong in this. Uh, the Enigma, the first encryption device in the Second World War, uh, was uh, an encryption device and in fact the Brits were able to decode it over time. Anyhow, uh, that aside. So um, how do you get cryptocurrency? Well, very simple. 
the first thing you need to do before you can get money is to get a wallet. And even here with crypto money or virtual money, you need to have a virtual wallet where you want to put your coins in. Now, the coins will not really go into there and a wallet or a virtual wallet is a piece of software. So you need to create that uh, wallet. And I'm going to show you that in a few seconds on how you can create your own wallet. Now, there's two types of wallets you can have. There's a hot wallet and there's a cold wallet. Now, a hot wallet is nothing more than you generating a public key and a private key. Now, don't get scared. We will go to this uh, public key and a private key on the Internet. And you can do this on a website from someone or you can do it on your own PC. But in fact, your wallet is always online. It's always connected to the Internet. Now, I don't recommend this because that's a high risk, because if somebody steals your wallet, then you lost all your money. And as I said before, there is no way to go to anybody to complain about it because you are fully responsible for your own safeguarding of your coins, right? Or your wallet. Now, so that's the hot wallet. Now, the cold wallet is a bit different. The cold wallet works as follows. You go into a website, you're extracting the software to generate these two keys. And it is the public key and the private key that makes up your wallet. And those are two mathematically matched keys. They go together. The private key, this is your, like your PIN code number. This is what you have on your bank card. Never give that to anybody. And the public key that has been generated, that is actually the address of your wallet. So if you need to send money to me, I will give you my public key. No secret to that. You will then encrypt the transaction, the coins and all the information. You will send it to me. And since I have my private key, for my public key, I can now decrypt that whole message or that whole transaction, unlock it, and then have that money uh, into my wallet. So never give away your private key. Now to generate the wallet, you will generate a public and a private key all automatically. Anyway, once you have the two keys, uh, public and private, now you have a wallet, but you have no coins. So how do you get the coins in there? Well you have to go to a business which is selling coins to you. I will have to transfer money from my bank account, which are my hard-earned euros and dollars, to the business that is going to sell me some crypto money, some ones and zeros, some, some piece of software, an entry in a ledger somewhere. And that company, they will take my euros and my dollars and put it on their bank account. And that's how they make money. So really, you know, you can see that they're selling us a bubble. But OK, enough of that, because otherwise you think I'm again back on the negative side of crypto money and I'm not. Right. So once you've done that, they will transfer these coins, virtual coins to your wallet because you will give them your public key and they will transfer it to you and you will be entered in the ledger. And that's how it goes. So the point here is if you lose your private key, you have lost all your money. Isn't that something? So you need to safeguard that. You can imagine if you leave your public and private key, or your wallet, on your PC, which is connected to the internet, which we call a hot wallet. Yeah, hackers can steal it. They can fish for it. So once it's gone, it's gone. You can't call anybody. It's your responsibility. So you lost your money. So that's something to be very, be aware of and be very careful. If you use a cold wallet, that's easy. Uh, you calculate the keys, you calculate your wallet, your public and private key, and then you either print it out on a piece of paper or you write it down. Now, the cold wallet is safe because nobody can get to it. It's offline. It's never on your PC, but you will have to bring it into the PC each time you want to do transactions and look at your wallet, of course. Um, but there are ways of doing it. So uh, this is all about the wallet. So now you have a wallet. Um, and as I said, transferring money between us is easy, right? Uh, so it's said that the public key is used to uh, receive money and the private key is used to spend coins. Uh, so that's how it works. So now um, let us have a look uh, on how all this is working uh, because we need to start looking a little bit about creating a wallet, and I'm going to show that to you on how it's done. We will also then look at how a miner is working, uh, how they prove the block, how they prove the transactions, 
how hashing is working, and the most important factor, how a blockchain is working. So what do we need to take along here is that if you lose your wallet, then you lost all your keys, you lost all your money, and then there's no way to get it back. There's one more thing I want to mention here. If you send money to a non-existing wallet, then the coins are lost. So keep that in mind. All right, so now let's have a look on how we create a wallet in practice. So let's create a wallet. And in this case, we're going to use a wallet which is actually online. Uh, as an example, just gonna click on it. And what you see right now is actually uh, the bitcoinaddress.org page. And since I moved my mouse around, you already have some input. You see the little dots of my mouse here? And that's now generating the big uh, string below. See that string there with all these uh, letters and ciphers in there? This is in hexadecimal. So I just need to move my mouse around and the dots that you get from my mouse that is actually generating random numbers. You can also put random numbers here in this box. Now, if you have enough uh, of these of that input, then the software returns something for you. It returns, first of all, a public key and they call it a share. And here is that key number, you can see that. You see the whole number here, the string, it's uh, numbers and letters, it's alphanumeric, lowercase, uppercase. Now this is your public key, this is also the address of your wallet, this one right here. So you will need to make sure that you save that. Then you have your private key, and this is called the secret, right? This is your private key, and the private key is right here, This is, that's what it is. So these are two important things. So if you lose your secret key, you lost all your coins. And this is just one example on how you can create a wallet. You can create as many wallets as you want, really. A uh, wallet doesn't have no effect. It's only once you start putting coins in there that it will be known. If you want to print this, you can just click up the paper wallet and then you can print out these uh, certificates, let's say, or these keys. What we just have done was creating a wallet uh, based on a piece of software that runs on a website. Now, that's not what I would recommend. You better download an application that generates these keys and do it offline. Uh, the tools themselves or the application itself is nothing more than a crypto algorithm that runs. In this specific case for Bitcoins, we are using what we call the elliptic, elliptic curve digital signature and it's going to generate based on the random seed number a long string which is almost impossible to be cracked. It would take about 200 years uh, to crack this with today's uh, computer power. Other currencies, they may use another algorithm like RSA. So you just saw on how you create a wallet in practice. So now we need to talk a bit about the blockchain. And the blockchain is what makes up the distributed ledger, is what makes it safe. That prevents anybody coming in and taking your coins somewhere from the past and redirect that coin. Remember that the ledger is a chronological sequence of transactions all linked together. So if anybody was able to come in somewhere in the past, then he would reallocate the coins, the virtual coins, by modifying a block which is holding all the transactions, then the whole system would be hacked. And that, of course, is not what we want. So the principle of a blockchain prevents that. And a blockchain is very simple. It's a complex name and the first time I saw it, I was like, wow, uh, what is this? But it's actually very simple. So a block is a bunch of transactions, right? Uh, me getting money, you paying me or whoever. And all these transactions have been verified by the miner. And I'll come to that verification process. Once a block has been verified, it goes into the blockchain. Now, a block which has been proven is having a hash. And a hash is a fixed number of bits representing the content of a file. If I change a single letter in that file or that document, then my hash will change. Now, and it's always a fixed length. So we talk about a hash 256, so a SHA 256, meaning that the hashing 
of my file is always 256 bits long. No matter how big my file is or how big my document is, it's always going to be the same length, but it will be unique. It will have a unique code, and again, in hexadecimal. So hashing is very important. So a proven block has its own hash. So the complete context of the block has gone through a hashing method, and then the hash is created and is described in 256 bits. So let me show you on how hashing works before we continue. So now let's have a look at what hashing is about, because hashing is the main security feature of the blockchain or the cryptocurrency. Now, in principle, the hashing is an algorithm that will convert a file of no matter what size to a fixed length output. And that's why we call it deterministic. So if you're using a SHA-256, you will always have 256 bits output after you hash this whole big file. The second thing is uh, always unique. So the result of that hashing is always a unique number. If you change a small character or anything, whatever you want to change the number or anything in the original file, then the hash will change. The other characteristic is that once you have the hash, you cannot go back to the original file. So there is no way from a hash you can calculate backwards the uh, actual um, file. And then finally is uh, a very good factor is that the fact that it's very fast. So um, it doesn't take a lot of CPU tax on your processors. So that's why hashing is a very popular and very easy to use solution. So let me give you now an example on how hashing works. And you'll see it on the screen in a few minutes, how simple that is, because when I'll talk, it all sounds complex, but it is not complex whatsoever. I have not calculated anything. And as you can see, it's a SHA-256 hash calculator. I'm just going to put some data in, and then you'll see what comes out of it. So I'm just going to type some hello there. And then we do the calculator of the SHA. You see that string that comes out. Now, I just had a few letters, hello there, and you see what the output is, and this is a hexadecimal output representing actually 256 bit. So if I add some more, I'm just gonna add a one. I will recalculate and look at the string, how that will change. See, this string right here changed immediately. If I go back, add another character, and I'm going to calculate. And again, it's all that. So it is pretty amazing. So now that you know how hashing is done, it's easy to understand on how a hash for a block is generated and how it's attached to the block. Now, the good thing is that the just approved block is also having a hash which is referring back to the previous block because the block that came before also has been hashed. So the previous block has its own hash, and that hash is now also sitting in the next block as a reference to the previous one. So now you can see that every block is connected to each other. I have my own hash on my block, which is pointing forward to the next block, the hash there. And in my own block, I have now a hash also pointing backwards towards the hash of the previous block. So you can see that all these blocks are now hashed together. Now, the principle here is that if anybody changes something in a block somewhere, and you just saw that, if you change a single letter in a file, the hash will change. So if you do that, then the hash of that block will change immediately and the link will be broken because the next block is still pointing back to the original hash of the previous block, which is now changed. So now that link is cut, broken. So that's why it's not allowed to do that. You can't do that. So that's the integrity of a blockchain. The hashes need to be linked. Now, you could say, well, yes, but then I calculate the hash again in the next block. So you potentially could do that. You could say, okay, I'm in now block 10, and I have like a 1,000 blocks in front of me, and I'm changing block 10. Well, then you would have to change 990 blocks in front of you while the the world keeps moving on, so it keeps adding. And in reality, this is kind of impossible because the time it takes to calculate uh, all the hashes and to calculate for a block, 
We don't have the compute power today to do that, so there's no way you can catch up. So that's the safety of a blockchain. So it's a bunch of blocks, chronologically ordered and linked to each other with their own hash and the hash of the previous block. So you can ask yourself the question, how secure is crypto money? I mean, yes, they use hashing, they use uh, elliptic curves to calculate the keys, the private key and the public key, or an RSA algorithm. But is it safe? Can these algorithms and the SHA not be cracked? And reality is, hackers will try to do that. And lucky for us, today's compute power isn't powerful enough to calculate or crack a private key. It would take about 200 years to get it done. Tomorrow, once quantum computing comes around the corner, that's going to be a complete different story. And remember this, what I just said, because that's going to be part of my final verdict of my final opinion about crypto money. Now, hashing is a bit of a different story. Hashing is a lot simpler and it is possible to generate in another block the same hash by putting some very specific input in. And that's what we call a birthday attack. So now we would have two blocks with the same hash and then blocks could be swapped. This is something you really don't want to happen, but you don't need to worry about it because the developers of crypto money, they know about these kind of attacks and what they have done is they came up with double hashing. So in other words, the hash is hashed by itself and that prevents this kind of an attack. And now let's have a look on how mining is working. All transactions that are occurring over the internet with cryptocurrency of a specific currency, of course, are sent to the miners and the miners will group these transactions into a block. And the block is typically about one megabyte and that's the case for the Bitcoin. Now, each transaction will have to be hashed and each hash of a transaction is then hashed with the hash of the other transaction. So we keep building up the hashes on hashes on hashes on hashes until we end up with a root hash. The lower uh, hashes, we call those leaf hashes and a leaf hash typically relates to a specific transaction. So the root hash is part of the header of the block and the header of the block has six fields. It has the software version of the block, it has the time of day, it has the root hash we just calculated, it has the hash uh, which links it to the previous block, it has a nonce and it actually has a target. Now the task now of the miner is to calculate the header uh, or hash the header in such a way that the result is lower than the target number and the target number is issued by the network. He has to do that by using a nonce and a nonce is a number, uh, an occasional occurrence let's say, that you need to put in. So he's going to add one to the block then calculates the hash. Is the result below the target number then he succeeded. If the result is bigger than the target number, then he'd failed. And he has to then increase the nonce to a 2, add a 2, add a 3, add a 4, add a 5, and so on, until he has a hash result, which is lower than the target. Now, the target is a variable setting because somehow the amount of coins that are getting into the network, they have to be constrained. So the level of complexity or effort for mining is controlled by two things, by the time of day, so how much time is allowed to do the mining, but also, and more real realistically, the actual target number. If you have a large target number, which is very high, then it's easy to mine a block because you don't need to have too many cycles going through a hash to come to a result. But if the number is very low, the value is very low of the target, then you will have to do a lot of calculations to find out the end result. Now, once the end result is known, when the result of the hashing is lower than the target, the block is sent to all the other miners, which will then do their verification on it and confirm that the block is valid and is good and is judged to be sound and to be added to the blockchain. Now, the miner is getting an award for this and the award are bitcoins or coins for that matter. And this is how coins are being generated. There's also a transaction fee. So the miner is a very important person. And I keep saying miner, but 
keep in mind it could also be a stakeholder in other currencies but the principle is always the same so now let me get to my final conclusion because i think that's far more important so you might remember that i talked about uh, the crypto algorithms the elliptic curves and the rsas and how hard it is to crack that with today's cpus well today we already have what we call a quantum computer this is a computer based on quantum technology, completely different of what we know today of silicon-based computers. And that computer can crack within 100 seconds the crypto algorithms that we use today. Now that means that within 100 seconds, somebody can steal your private key because they will have cracked it. And if they steal your private key, well, then you lost all your coins. And that's a major threat to all cryptocurrencies in existence today because they all use the same crypto algorithms. And I predict that between now and possibly five years, something like this is going to happen. The wrong guy is going to get his hands on a quantum computer and will be able to crack the crypto algorithms. And if he does so, he will steal all the money. And you can imagine what's going to happen. Everybody that has crypto money will try to sell it as fast as they can. And because the system is based on supply and demand, there's a lot of supply, prices will tumbling down and they, the money will be worth nothing because crypto money is just a piece of software. It has no inherent value, as I explained before. So therefore, I don't think that crypto money is a good investment in the long term. In fact, it is not a good investment at all. It is what we call speculation. And yes, you can get rich from it when you speculate, but don't do it with money that you might need later. If you count on the money for your retirement, if you count on money for your children to go to college, I would not at all try to speculate with that money, and certainly not with Bitcoins or Ether or whatever currency that you find today on, on, on the cyberspace. Not the place to be. But of course, it's fast, it's mobile, uh, it's fashion, it's trendy, and it's a hype. Um, but again, you can become rich from it, from a hype. Uh, I'm not saying that. Um, so, Time will tell where we're ending up, but keep in mind that if you're going to use crypto money, that you have to play your own bank. So you have to safeguard your keys. And if you lose them, well, too bad, you lost all your money. There's nowhere to go to. Uh, there's no institution, there's no regulation, no nothing. And it's all kind of a, sorry to say so, a softer bubble that can explode any moment in time. So I hope you enjoyed this video uh, as much as I did and please by all means make comments because I haven't gone in all the details uh, but I think it was more than sufficient to explain why I'm not going to do this uh, for the reasons I just explained. So thank you for viewing. Bye-bye.